making our way through uh, the book of Revelation. And as I uh, mention often, how many not only direct quotes but allusions uh, to the Old Testament, that the book of Revelation is just filled with, with so much imagery uh, drawn from the Old Testament, but then John, from John's day as well. And then we try to make application to our own day. Last week, we looked at those uh, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And we go, oh my, because um, those were terrible signs. Those were, were difficult things to look at, signs of God's judgment um, as he justly uh, brings about the conclusion to time and brings evil to an end and ushers in that new age. We, when we looked at those uh, seven seals, we noticed that uh, between the uh, sixth and the seventh seal there, we kind of hit the pause button there. And Revelation chapter 7 just gave us that insight as we went through uh, a judgment after judgment after judgment. We asked, oh, Lord, who could stand? And we saw that it's only by the grace of Jesus Christ. As the 144,000 are sealed by God and protected, we recognize that in that uh, allusion then to the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples, times a hundred or times a thousand, the perfect, you know, whole number, that really it's the whole church, all the people of God are sealed and protected. And then that silence and perfect preparation for the seven trumpets. We went through the seven trumpets, and again, there was just, you know, the, these cataclysmic events. But what we're going to look at today is another pause button, that pause between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, and that's going to be our focus for today. In our message today, we're going to meet what's described as a mighty angel. A mighty angel with one foot on earth and another foot on the sea, kind of an illustration of, of power over land and sea, uh, with his right hand raised to heaven, giving a swearing allegiance to God and testifying to the truth, but then holding out a little scroll for the Apostle John to devour. So let's look at our passage today. Revelation chapter 10. And again, where I've highlighted in yellow, and then the uh, reference point below there is uh, the Old Testament passages uh, where these illusions come from. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. And when we hear that language, perhaps you're just thinking, boy, that sounds a lot like the picture of the Son of Man from Revelation chapter 1, or maybe the throne room of heaven from Revelation chapter 4. And again, that imagery is the same, but a different being here. This is not Jesus. This is not God on the throne. This is a mighty angel. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. And he planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. This is the voice then from heaven. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do, do not write it down. And then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, and the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. We're in this pause button between the sixth and the seventh. And as we saw last week, these are each uh, kind of covering the same ground, but as we go through it, it gets successively, progressively worse. But now, as we're approaching that seventh trumpet, along with the seventh seal and then the seventh bowl, it's like now the finality is coming. There was this long period of grace, a long period of waiting and delay, but now the finality is coming. There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished. That mystery, 
that mystery that he sent his son into this world, that, he, that his son gave his life dying on the cross, that grace is extended to, to God's chosen people, but that that choosing extends not only to the, the, the uh, Jewish nation, but to all who receive Jesus Christ. The mystery of the Gentiles, Paul talks about. That mystery is accomplished, that God's kingdom is a far-reaching kingdom and embraces from people from every land and nation and language and people and tongue and tribe. It embraces it all. That's what he has announced to his servants, the prophets. You read through the Old Testament, and those words are there. And so we see this mighty angel proclaiming these things are about to take place. But we might ask, well, who is this mighty angel? And you saw the, the, the references there to Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, that mighty angel is identified as Michael. Michael, who is the great prince who protects God's people, it says in Daniel 12. That's significant. That this mighty angel now shows up for John. And for the words that are given in this scroll, he is this great prince who protects God's people. We also discover that he assists Daniel against the prince of the Persian kingdom. And in that context, it, it, this looks like a part of the heavenly warfare that is going on. This prince of the Persian kingdom seems aligned with Satan. And Michael assists Daniel in that. And then in Jude chapter 9, we, we see Michael who confronts Satan with the truth and, and exposing his lies. Michael is there to defend the truth. And then finally in Revelation 12, which we'll be getting to next week, Michael is there leading the war in heaven against Satan and hurls him down to earth. And so we see not only God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but we see this company of angels and these mighty angels as well there to help and protect the church and to strengthen the church in its mission and its task. This mighty angel is sent to the Apostle John to give him these words. Let's go on. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once again, Go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will turn your stomach sour. But in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey. And so I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. And then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And this little scroll now, different than the scroll that Jesus took which we saw in Revelation 5, different than God's plan of, of working out history that Jesus is the only one found worthy to break the seals and to carry out God's work and God's will. This is now a little scroll that John is given and asked to eat. And the reference is there from Ezekiel chapter 3. When Ezekiel is called into ministry, he's also asked to eat a scroll. And this scroll is God's word, God's testimony, the message that God has given to Ezekiel to proclaim to the house of Israel to, about how they need to repent and, and turn around. And being God's word, God's word is often described as sweet as honey in the Old Testament. And so when, as you eat it, it, it's sweet. God's word is so beautiful, it's so precious. And, and, and certainly its truth, its richness, its love, and its grace is all part of that, that God's word. But unfortunately, as we speak God's word, expecting, intending for people to respond and to see its sweetness and its grace and just say, oh yes, that's exactly what I want, that's exactly what I need, sometimes people say, no, that's stupid. Why would I want to do that? You are so deluded, and, and it gets thrown back in our face, and that's when God's word turns sour. 
because people reject it. And they reject us. And they turn against us, sometimes irrationally, and, and, and attack. And we're just like, what did I do to deserve this? It's not you. It's God's word they are rejecting. And that's when things turn sour and bitter. Ezekiel had that as, as, I mean, you would expect. You go to the nation Israel and you say, thus saith the Lord, and people should go, oh, yeah, of course. That's what we should do. We should repent and turn back and follow the ways of God. It's so obvious. But no, even in Ezekiel's day, the leaders said, forget you. We're not following you. We're doing our own thing. And for Ezekiel, the sourness and bitterness was not only the fact that he was rejected, but he knew that when people rejected God's word, there would only be judgment left for them. And within a short period of time in Ezekiel's day, sure enough, enemy nations came and attacked and carried God's people away. But now this mighty angel gives John the scroll and says, you too, you must eat it. You must prophesy. It's sweet. It's lovely. It's God's grace. It's God's love. You must proclaim it. But John, don't expect it's all going to go well. It will turn sour for you as well. But yet you must prophesy again and again. We can't give up. Because God's desire is that all peoples, all nations, all languages, all kings have a chance to hear the truth and turn and repent. This scroll, this little scroll, we have, we take, we eat. It's sweet and good, but it's meant to be shared as well. And so when we... Now, it started out and we looked at these major themes in the book of Revelation. We want to affirm again, this is what we need to proclaim. God is in control. Jesus has won the victory. But Satan's power is real and dangerous. Satan and his followers will be judged. But we must be vigilant and prepared. We must live faithfully. But we can have hope and confidence. And that's the message that that mighty angel helps us to proclaim. We move on then to chapter 11, where it starts out with a, a measuring rod that is given to John. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God, just like Ezekiel was told in Ezekiel 40. But not only measure the temple of God, but its altar and its worshipers. And so this, this measuring that, that goes on, is, is not only uh, measuring and, and, and understanding the greatness and the presence of God in the temple, but also the altar where the atonement for sins are made. But then also the worshipers who are there, people who have come to worship the God of heaven, but to have their sins atoned for, and now are embraced in this whole uh, community of worship. John is given instructions to measure it all. All of this needs to be included. The greatness of God, the atonement of Jesus Christ, but then people who have responded and come to receive all of that. Measure all of that, John, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. We'll deal with that in just a second. It's been given to the Gentiles, John. Exclude that. But... They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. There's going to be enemies that come and will trample on the city. And from Daniel chapter 12, this, this 42 months, this three and a half years, sometimes described as 1,260 days or, or a variety of, of variations there, all represent half of seven, half of the completeness. Because Jesus told us that those days of tribulation and pain would be cut short 
would be shortened for the benefit of the elect, for the benefit of the saints. Who could stand if we had to endure all of it? And so all of these references of 42 months or 1,260 days or three and a half years or times, times, and half a time all refer to God's judgment, yes, but God's grace as well. Even in his judgment, he holds back and says, I'm not going to unleash it all until the time is ripe for the benefit of my people, for the benefit of those who live there. Okay, back to that temple. Here's a picture, a model of what uh, Jerusalem and the temple looked like in the days of Jesus and the days of John. Around the temple is a barrier, a wall, uh, not that high, about three, four feet high, called the balustrade. That balustrade was meant to be a wall of separation on, that Gentiles could come into those outer courts to worship God, but they could not proceed beyond that wall, beyond that balustrade, at risk of death. Uh, there was like 13 little inscriptions all along that wall that said things like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, no intruder is allowed in the courtyard and within the wall surrounding the temple. Those who enter will invite death for themselves. And the understanding at that time is, is that uh, Gentiles, those not born of, of, of Jewish you know, background and descent, could not come close to God. They were unclean. They didn't keep God's law. They didn't have the ritual purities. And so they needed to be separated. They needed to be set apart. They could come close. They could come near, but not as close as God's chosen people. That's why that wall was there. But through the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished on the cross, Paul uh, makes this reference in, in the book of Ephesians, and he says, He himself, that is Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one, Jew and Gentile, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What Paul is trying to say and, and what the early church wrestled with is this, how does this work now? God raised up for his people from the Jewish nation. Not all of them trusted in him, but there was a, a good faithful amount. But now Jesus has come. He gave his life for the sins of all people. When they come to faith in Jesus Christ, do they have to become Jewish? And there was this great debate. And they went back and forth, but through the revelation of God, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, the early church understood, no, they don't have to become Jewish and keep the ceremonial law anymore. They've been forgiven through Jesus Christ. They have full access, are fully welcomed into the church of Jesus Christ. And so now, as Paul envisions this spiritual temple, he says, there's no more barrier. There's no more wall. All have access through Jesus Christ. All are welcome to come right in and worship God freely and fully. But now what's John talking about? What's John talking about with, with, with this barrier and excluding the outer courts and the Gentiles? Exclude the outer courts. Do not measure it. It has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. John is using the term Gentile not in terms of ethnicity, but in terms of the spiritual opposite of God's people, of believers. Gentile now is, is a reference to all those who have not accepted Jesus Christ, those who have not come into the presence of God. He would embrace the concept of, of Jews as being all those, whether from Gentile origin or Jewish origin, but all those who have become a part of the family of God. But you know, there are those who, not, who have not accepted Jesus Christ. They need to be excluded they are not part of this family of God. They are not a part of this worshiping community. They are not a part, will not be a part of the ultimate perfect heaven that God is preparing for his people. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. In 66 A.D., 
the Jewish nation revolted against Rome. Rome sent one of its top generals, Titus, to put down the rebellion for three and a half years, approximately. He laid siege to Jerusalem. The famine, the suffering, the death, it's just unimaginable. And then after approximately three and a half years, they broke in, trampled through the holy city, burned the temple, and destroyed it. John is drawing upon that powerful imagery. He's saying these days that are coming will be tough, will be hard. But God is preparing for you. John, measure. Measure this new temple. Measure its altar. Measure the worshipers because God is preparing a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more pain, no more suffering. Jesus is making all things new. I'm getting ahead of myself. Revelation 21 and 22. It's interesting that on that temple site today, a, a site that has been desecrated by many Gentile nations through the years, sits the Dome of the Rock, the second most important uh, holy site for the Muslim faith. And I'm not making any commentary on that. I'm not in a position to make predictions and whatever, but it's just very interesting from a historical point of view that a Muslim holy site is now sitting where God's temple sat. And it'll be interesting to see as Jesus breaks the seals and unfolds history, what will happen on that piece of real estate. It's the kind of tension that Jerusalem lives with day in and day out and forms a backdrop to all of the political things that go on in the region today. We move on to the two witnesses, two powerful witnesses. John writes, and I will, uh, uh, I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees, trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of all the earth. It's a reference to um, Zechariah chapter 4, where Zerubbabel the king and Joshua the priest are identified as these uh, two olive trees and, and two lampstands, and they were a part of the renewal and restoration of the people of Israel following the uh, Babylonian captivity. If anyone tries to harm them, these are now the two witnesses again that John's speaking of, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is, how anyone who, this is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. And we're kind of going like, I don't remember anything about Zerubbabel and, and Joshua doing that, but... Do you remember any other Old Testament characters? Fire coming down, calling upon it not to rain, turning waters into blood, striking a nation with every kind of plague. Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses, representative of the law and the prophets. And so we have a king, we have a priest, Zerubbabel and Joshua. We have the law and the prophets. It's like the totality of the Old Testament witness is wrapped up in these two witnesses as they go around and, and proclaim the word of God. 
It's like all of the, the, the testimony from the Old Testament is wrapped up in these two individuals. As they speak to the earth one more time, repent, believe, come to Jesus Christ. The story of Elijah. Perhaps you remember that, that confrontation on Mount Carmel where the prophets of Baal are gathered together and Ahab and Jezebel and so forth and they make two altars and, and Elijah prays and fire comes down from heaven and, and, and burns up the altar and looks a, a dramatic victory for God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Just a short time later, the king summons Elijah, and Elijah's kind of off in the countryside, and the king sends a, a, a captain and, and 50 men to go and get Elijah and to bring him back to the palace. And that first captain walks up with the 50 uh, soldiers behind him, and he says, Elijah, the king says, come. Oh, he, he said, man of God, the king says, come. And Elijah says, well, if I'm a man of God, let fire come from heaven. The captain and the 50 guys were toast. Right there. The king doesn't like that. He's, he gets another captain, sends another 50 guys, and this, you know, these are the really tough ones, and they come out there. This, these are the special forces, you know. It's just like, man of God, the king demands that you come. Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, May fire come from heaven. <laughs> Toast. The king sends a third captain with 50 men. That captain comes up and says, Oh, man of God, would you please spare my life? I know that you worship the true God, but listen, the king back there, he sent me, and if, if you would just in any way, please, please, <laughs> come. Elijah goes, okay. And they go before the king. And again, it's this, this fire from the mouth. The power of God is there. But for those who come in humility and weakness and, and, and understand that they are unworthy to stand before God, to make any demands before God, their lives are spared by the grace of God. But those who are arrogant who speak proud and boastful words. They face the wrath and judgment of God. The same thing was true with, with Moses uh, speaking to Pharaoh. Moses, uh, a runaway slave, has no right be to come before the king of all the earth. But by the time the ten plagues are done, the roles have been reversed, and it's Pharaoh who's pleading with Moses. These two powerful witnesses represent the power and the testimony that God has for us in his scriptures. Two powerful witnesses, starting out king and priest, the law and the prophets, then also culminating especially in Jesus Christ. But now Jesus hands this over to the apostle John, and when we get to the end of our message today, we'll find that that torch has been passed, that scroll has been passed one more time. Now, when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them. A reference to uh, Daniel 7, but then we'll study that next week in Revelation 12. Uh, overpowered and killed them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. This gets a little complicated, but Sodom basically representing uh, the worst immorality on the earth and uh, Egypt representing uh, power and arrogance. But then it says where also their Lord was crucified. And we're going like, well, I know this one, Jerusalem, right? That's where Jesus was crucified. Unfortunately, Jerusalem is never called the great city, and, and in the book of Revelation, the great city always refers to figuratively Babylon, which then represents Rome, uh, the great city of John's day. And, and you're going like, well, Jesus wasn't crucified in Rome. Some commentators point out that it was a Roman governor, uh, Pilate, who sentenced Jesus to death, so in that way, it, it makes a little sense, but again, we'll close the message with another story. For three and a half days... Three and a half. 
Some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts. Yay, we killed the Christians. They're gone. They don't have to mess with us anymore because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet. Did you ever hear the story of the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel 37? These, these bones look hopeless. They're, they're dry. It, it, there's no life there at all. But the message comes, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel goes, Lord, only you know. And then the wind blows. Wind, breath, spirit, all the same word in Hebrew. The wind blows and the bones come together and flesh appears and new life comes to this dried up people of God. They are reborn again. And so also then with these witnesses, though they testified faithfully to God, they were killed by the beast, yet God vindicates them by bringing them back to life and honoring them. Such a terror struck those who saw them. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and all their enemies looked on. Elijah was caught up in a, a whirlwind and brought up into heaven. He didn't have to face death. These two witnesses, at that very hour, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven, just like King Nebuchadnezzar did after he went through his time of humiliation, Daniel 4. And the second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. Okay, folks, I know, a lot here. Let me do just a quick summary, though, of these two powerful witnesses. The two witnesses were empowered with God's word and were given authority to proclaim his message to the world. However, Satan and his followers opposed them and killed them, publicly ridiculing them. Yet God, by his spirit, raised them from the dead, vindicating them before their enemies. He then called them to heaven to receive their eternal reward. Let me make some connections now. Jesus, before he returned to heaven, gathered his disciples together and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now you, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He transferred his authority to them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus gives his little scroll to the disciples. Now you go out as my witnesses. Surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. And then in Acts chapter 1, we have the ascension story. The disciples are asking, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. priest, king, the law, Jesus, John, and now us. We are his witnesses. We've been given his power and his authority. We've been given his word to go out into our community with the scroll of the word of God to share his love and grace, to share his truth, to invite people to come and say that the barrier that, that, that's been broken down through Jesus Christ, you now have full access to the Father. Come, repent of your sins. Turn to Jesus Christ. Come and find the love and grace of God. But sometimes we're scared. Sometimes we feel like we don't know what to say. Sometimes we don't know our scroll well enough. We need to become more familiar. But, you know, it's as simple as telling the story 
of Jesus in your life. What has Jesus done for you? How has he been at work in your life? That's what communicates to people and done in a gracious and caring and loving way makes an eternity of difference. But you won't save everyone. In fact, you won't save anybody, though God does that. Not everyone will respond to you as you hoped, even if you do it well, because there still is that spirit of opposition, of power, of arrogance. I don't have to bend my knee to you, God. I'm doing things my way. But that can't deter us as witnesses. We've promised to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. And so we've got a mission to do, a job to carry out, to proclaim the love and truth of Jesus Christ in the world around us, those that we have contact with. The Suan family, they were called to Dominican Republic. Wonderful. The, the Dykesons are, uh, you know, working with crew. The Westergrins in, in Madrid, Spain. But you know what? God has placed you as a missionary right where you are to reach the people you have a connection with. We need to remember, as Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. We can't expect it to always go perfectly and easy. In fact, if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed, says Peter. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone to ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But you might be saying, oh, that sounds so difficult. That's, that, that sounds so painful. Why doesn't God just come and, and be done with it? And we don't have to worry about all this kind of stuff right now. Why doesn't God just come? Make everything right again. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done it will be laid bare. But since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. You see, the work of the gospel is not done. And the church isn't doing it. The end cannot yet come. And so Jesus, as he's opening his seals, is saying, Church, church, do the job I've called you to do, extend my love and grace because I don't want anyone to perish but all to come to life. The story is told. It's written in a document that comes from late 2nd century uh, A.D. So this is well after the time of uh, Peter. And so we can't prove the uh, accuracy of the story, but the story is powerful. There was a time when the church in Rome heard about and understood that Nero, the emperor, was going to be rounding up Christians and going after the leadership. And they urged Peter, who was alive at that time, Peter, get out of town. Get out of town. Leave, Peter. Go. We don't want to lose you. And, and Peter was on his way out of town. But in a vision, he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, I'm going to Rome to be crucified. And Peter said, Lord, you've already been crucified. Will you be crucified again? 
And Jesus said, yes, because as my people suffer and are crucified, I suffer and am crucified. And Jesus went on to Rome. And Peter came out of his vision, realized he should not be leaving Rome, but being there with his Lord and with his people. And so he turned around and went back and was crucified. For Jesus. For his word. Because he knew that nothing could separate him from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, his Lord. And so he was willing to suffer all things for the testimony and the witness to the love and grace of God. Church, are you going to run away? Or are you going to face in God's strength and with his help? What Jesus faced, Jesus said to his disciples, and surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Lord, we have your word, an ancient word, but a powerful word, a word which testifies to who you are and what you're all about. But the world doesn't want to accept it. Lord, we pray, strengthen your church for its task to be witnesses for you in this age. Come what may, Lord, let us proclaim who you are, what you have done, and then watch you bring all who've been called into your family. In your name we pray. Amen. Crescendo.